This universality which the individual as such attains is pure being, death. It is a state which has been reached immediately in the course of nature, not the result of an action consciously done. The duty of the member of a family is on that account to add to this aspect, in order that the individual's ultimate being, too, shall not belong solely to nature and remain something irrational, but shall be something done, and the right of consciousness be asserted in it. Or rather, the meaning of the action is that, because in truth the calm and universality of a self-conscious being do not belong to nature, the illusory appearance that the death of the individual results from a conscious action on the part of nature may be dispelled, and the truth established. What nature did in the individual is that aspect in which his development into a universal is exhibited as the movement of an immediate existent. This movement falls, it is true, within the ethical community and has this for its end. Death is the fulfillment and the supreme work which the individual as such undertakes on its behalf. But insofar as he is essentially a particular individual, it is an accident that his death was directly connected with his work for the universal and was the result of it, partly because if his death was such a result, it is the natural negativity and movement of the individual as a mere existent, in which consciousness does not return into itself and become self-consciousness, or partly because, since the movement of what merely exists consists in its being superseded and becoming a being for self, death is the side of deremption in which the attained being for self is something other than the mere existent which began the movement. Because the ethical order is spirit in its immediate truth, the sides into which its consciousness sunders itself also fall into this form of immediacy, and individuality passes over into this abstract negativity, which being in its own self without consolation and reconciliation, must receive them essentially through a real and external act. Blood relationship supplements, then, the, na the abstract natural process by adding to it the movement of consciousness, interrupting the work of nature and rescuing the blood relation from destruction. Or better, because destruction is necessary, the passage of the blood relation into mere being, it takes on itself the act of destruction. Through this, it comes about that the dead, the universal being, becomes a being that is returned into itself, a being for self, or the powerless, simply isolated individual has been raised to universal individuality. The dead individual, by having liberated his being from his action or his negative unity, is an empty singular, merely a passive being for another, at the mercy of every lower irrational individuality and the forces of abstract material elements, all of which are now more powerful than himself the former on account of the life they possess, the latter on account of their negative nature. The family keeps away from the dead this dishonoring of him by unconscious appetites and abstract entities and puts its own action in their place and weds the blood relation to the bosom of the earth, to the elemental imperishable individuality. The family thereby makes him a member of a community which prevails over and holds under control the forces of particular material elements and the lower forms of life, which sought to unloose themselves against him and to destroy him. This quite long paragraph, 452, involves an analysis of the role, and you might say the options for death, what death means, what it turns into, for the, the family member understood as an individual who has died. We saw in the previous paragraph Hegel finishing things up by suggesting that an individual really only attains a, a certain mode of universality when their life has come to a finish. And, and he doesn't explore that uh, all that much in that paragraph. Here, he, he's also not exploring that thing, that notion, in terms of, say, legacy or the agency of the, the person who has died. Instead, he is interested primarily in the agency of the blood relative, the member of the family who is living. And we're going to see this play itself out in the paragraphs yet to come. For, for this, we're looking at the dead person, you might say, almost as the patient in the, in the classical term, not in the medical term, the person who is 
uh, undergoing, the person who is suffering, who is having something imposed upon them or provided to them. So let's see what he has to say here. There's, there's an awful lot. He says, this universality which the individual as such attains is pure being death. Now that's a very interesting thing to point out. Uh, people often ask, what is Hegel's doctrine of being or Hegel's position on being? And Hegel's consistent view is that when we're talking about being in contradistinction to, say, spirit, um, what we're talking about is something that, you know, is, is, right? It's being, but it's in an impoverished way. And death, uh, you might say, well, that's the cessation of being or that's non-being. Well, not completely. It's the end of living being. It's the end of this whole process that we call life. But it isn't just the end of being per se. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about this. Um, I'll, I'll just suggest that, you know, when we're talking about pure being for Hegel, we're not talking about getting to something that is, you know, really at the core of things. He doesn't build on a foundation of pure being. Rather, it's the higher infuses, you might say, the lower or drags it in. That's part of what the, the whole process of sublation and the dialectic is about. So he goes on and he says, um, this is a state which has been reached immediately in the course of nature. Now, why does he bring up nature here? Well, because we do exist in a natural world. And when a person dies... I'm, you know, there's a lot of things we can uh, introduce as sort of meditations upon <clears throat> the nature and our cultural attitudes and our, our own experiences with death. When a person dies, there is indeed a natural process. It could be very abrupt. You know, somebody is stabbed or they, they fall and, 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 you know, they break their neck uh, or, or all sorts of things like that. Or it might be a very long illness. Um, it could be, you know... An accident occurs and they bleed out, but it takes, you know, the course of over a day and they're in quite a bit of uh, pain usually as as that occurs. Um, You know, if you think about the ways in which human bodies can die, they they are quite literally (laughs) myriads in the sense of, you know, thousands. Um, You know, so there are a lot of natural processes and we often think of death as, you know, the body... Uh, returning to its elements is sometimes how how it's framed. So there is this aspect to death, right? But then what about when we're talking about the death of a person, an individual? He says, um, you know, it's a state that's been reached in the course of nature, not as a result of an action consciously done. The duty of the member of a family is on, on that account to add this aspect in order that the individual's ultimate being, too, shall not belong solely to nature and remain something irrational, but shall be something done and the right of consciousness be asserted in it. So there's a lot that that was just said there. The family member, now Hegel's not saying that this is something that is universally practiced, that everybody does this. Um, some people die, you know, with, without the possibility of this, either because they die apart from their family or because their family aren't the kind of people who would actually recognize this as, uh, as a, not just a duty, but as something that's, that's good, something that, that realizes um, who and what they themselves are in relation to uh, the other. Um, the family member's purpose in this is to... Keep this from being merely a natural occurrence. You might say to keep nature from swallowing up the personhood of the individual. Um, And we'll talk about examples of how that that occurs a little bit further on in. So he says, or rather, the meaning of the action is that because in truth the calm and universality of a self-conscious being do not belong to nature. That's an interesting thing. The calm and universality of the self-conscious being as the dead does not belong to nature. Nature already is not the totality of of what is for somebody like Hegel. 
That doesn't mean that there's a radical dualism here between spirit and nature or culture and nature or body and soul or any of these sorts of things. Nature matters. The natural world is. It's, it's where we move around and negotiate and live and die. But it's not all there is. And it's, it's not all there is either in the sense of, well, there's just like a little residue and the natural world is the most of what there is. No, the natural world is taken up into the, the geistige Welt, the, the world of spirit. So Hegel goes on and he says, um, the illusory appearance that the death of the individual results from a conscious action on the part of nature may be dispelled and the truth established. There, there is no consciousness involved in natural processes, right? They just are what they are. So he goes on and he says, what nature did in the individual is that aspect in which his development into a universal is exhibited as the movement of an immediate existence. This movement falls, it is true, within the ethical community. And has this for its end. So already we're, we're, there's an elevation out of nature. The person is dying, a natural process. They are dying within nature as a person with a body. And even a mind that is, in large respect, Hegel has no problem saying this, in large respect, uh, their brain. But not just that, right? And so the ethical community gets brought up here. And the ethical community is already something where we're moving beyond mere nature. So what is going on here? He says, um, this movement falls within the ethical community. It has it this for its end. Death is the fulfillment and the supreme work which the individual as such undertakes on its behalf. So insofar as the individual is dying, they are, in a certain respect, in, in relation to their ethical community. And the ethical community here is not the family as such, although the family has an ethical dimension, as we've just seen. Instead, the ethical community is the, the folk, the people, the community, or the state, or however we want to understand it. Something more public. Now, how does your death or the death of your loved one or the death of somebody that you don't know, how does that fit in with the ethical community? Well, it could, we could think of a number of different ways. Hegel is not spelling that out at this point. And the example that he's going to use a little bit later is going to be kind of a strange one. But we might think of, you know, so death is the culmination of your life. The finish point. What in the course of your life did you contribute to that ethical community? You probably contributed labor. As a matter of fact, you almost definitely contributed labor of one form or another. You also transmitted meaning. You also probably were involved, for better or for worse, in the process of bringing up the next generation and preparing for things. Those are just a few possible examples. So again, he goes on and he says, um, here we go. Insofar as he's essentially a particular individual, not just understood as this person who's a member of the, the community, but as a particular individual, somebody who matters on their own account. It is an accident that his death was directly connected with his work for the universal and was the result of it. Why? Hegel tells us, partly because if his death was such a result, it is the, the natural negativity and movement of the individual as a mere existent in which consciousness does not return to itself and become self-consciousness. So when we're thinking about individuals and, and we adopt the sort of you know, top-down perspective, what we call a third-person perspective, we're looking at them from the outside, we can't see, although we sometimes do judge, you know, structures of motivation, but we can't actually see what's going on in their own relation to the, themselves, how they understand their identity. It's kind of funny because we, we talk an awful lot about people's identity and we love to explore that 
in, you know, artsy ways in radio shows and podcasts and works of art and stuff like that. And that's almost always some, you know, some person who, you know, is, is supposed to stand in as a token for a whole bunch of other people and be an individual. I mean, there's a lot that could be said along those lines. Hegel's point here is insofar as we're just considering the person as a member of the ethical community, we're not actually thinking about them as a particular individual. It's the family that's going to restore that. Why aren't we? Because we're not grasping them as self-consciousness. We're grasping them as consciousness. So he goes on and he says, insofar as he's essentially a particular individual, it was an accident, right? That, that his death was, was connected with his work for the universal. And so um, he goes on and he, he also says, if his death was such a result, it is the natural negativity and the movement of the individual's mere existence, right? Um, in which consciousness does not return to itself, or partly because, since the movement of what merely exists consists in it being suspended and becoming a being for self, death is the side of diremption in which the attained being for self is something other than the mere existent which began the movement. What is it to be a particular individual? It is not just to remain a being in itself or a being for other, a being for the community. It is to be being for self. How do we attain that? This is a central question in human development. How do we become beings who are self-consciousness in and for themselves? Hegel is addressing part of the, the question here. Not in terms of the living being, except in so, so far as the living being is the family member who's doing something, but in terms of the family member who has died. How do the dead have being for self? How are the dead continued consciousnesses? How are the dead who they were? This is, this is a really central and, and quite, you know, often mysterious question. Hegel is touching on something here that takes us to the very cusp of an experience that we, we cannot escape because mortality is inescapable. Not only our mortality, our own being for, for death, as Heidegger calls it, right? But even more so, that of the other, the, the other who is going to die eventually, and we're going to have to come to terms with that death, or who has already died by the time that we come on the scene. If we're a member of a, a long-standing family, there are, are relatives that we, we know in a certain sense who have long since passed on. And we might extend this to other uh, things besides the family as well. We could think of you know spiritual communities, um, we could think of, you know, what goes on, say, in intentional communities such as monasteries. We can think of um, uh, schools of, of philosophy. We could we could think of all sorts of very interesting continuities in this respect. So going on, um, Hegel says, here we go, because the ethical order is spirit in its immediate truth, the sides into which its consciousness sunders itself also fall into this form of immediacy. An individual individuality passes over into this abstract negativity, which being in its own self without consolation and reconciliation must receive them essentially through a real and external act. All right, what is he saying there? The ethical order is spirit in its immediate truth. The sides sunder themselves into immediacy and abstract ne negativity. The abstract negativity of the dead individual lacks con consolation and reconciliation. It cannot provide it to, it to itself. And the ethical community is not providing it to it either. It must get it from somewhere else. Where will it get it? From the family members. So Hegel says, blood relationship supplements then the abstract natural process by adding to it the movement of consciousness. It interrupts the work of nature. It interrupts the natural processes. How do we do this? Well, think for example 
<clears throat> this is going to be a, a, you know, what Hegel's ultimately talking about, about our funerary rites and the fact that we mark out space and indeed time. We carve out pieces for our dead relatives and then perhaps have rituals. Uh, you know, we have Memorial Day here in the West. Um, you know, in, in some cultures, there are grave cleaning ceremonies. And all of those are occasions, not just to go and get some, some ritual out of the way, but to once again, recall and perhaps even commune with the dead relatives to provide them with what they don't have in the present. We, we the living, lend them our, our capacities for self-consciousness, you might say, from the Hegelian perspective. All right, so Hegel goes on and he says, um, we interrupt the work of nature and we rescue the blood relation from destruction. Or better, because destruction is necessary. Destruction in some sense, right? The passage of the blood relation into mere being, it takes on itself the act of destruction. Through this, it comes about that the dead, the universal being, becomes a being that has returned into itself, a being for self. Or the powerless, simply isolated individual has been raised to universal individuality. We, the living, again, we, the living, give the dead the power that they have, for better or for worse. This is kind of a double-edged sword. And uh, Hegel's not really concerned with analyzing that aspect of it, but we could certainly think about this, how the, you know, the dead retain their grasp over the living when it's really just the living you know, continuing on. This is one of the fundamental insights uh, of uh, uh, you know anthropological theories uh, about about uh, what human cultures do, uh, Marx has a very interesting discussion of, of this sort of thing in terms of capital and its capacity for extracting labor and how dead labor is used to, to you know grasp living labor. Um, you know Freudian depth psychology and, and others following in its wake have other similar things to say about this. Um, we could go on and on. Uh, any, in any case, coming back to this. So he says, um, the dead individual, by having liberated his being from his action or his negative unity, is an empty singular, merely a passive being for another, at the mercy, at the mercy of every lower irrational individuality and the forces of abstract material elements all of which are now more powerful than himself. Why? The former on account of the life they possess, the latter on account of their negative nature. <clears throat> so let's talk about this. Let's talk about the latter, which is nature. The dead, considered solely in terms of their relation with nature, is being consumed by nature, right? And you can see this even with, say, gravestones, right? You take your dead person and you embalm their body, stick them in a coffin, put them in a grave, put a headstone up there. And if nobody maintains that sort of stuff, it may take quite a while. I mean, some people go so far as concrete vaults, you know, because we have this, this worry about corruption. Corruption is simply nature taking back the body uh, which came from it in the first place. And through a whole variety of processes, most of which seem to involve bacteria of one form or another, right? We could, we could go on and on with this. Nature will take the dead person and consume it because that's the way it works. What is he talking about with any individuality? Um, he says the dead individual, right? is at the mercy of every, every lower irrational individuality. What would that be? Well, think about your, your, your estate. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some wonderful uh, biblical passages about you know, the, the foolishness of the person who labors their entire life and then is just going to pass on those things to some schmuck who uh, will do whatever the hell they want with them. 
And we can say similar things about people who are more conscious in their willing or their legacies. It can always be turned to something that you did not want. Your, your individuality can be turned into something quite different. You can become a bad guy in somebody's history book because the uh, intellectual fashions of the time have now a narrative in which the good deeds that you did are actually tainted by all sorts of bad characteristics that you have by belonging to the culture of your time. Um, you know, prime example, Aristotle, right? Aristotle defended slavery. <clears throat> well, he only defended a certain kind of slavery and actually critiqued other kinds and provided us with, you know, some good, good criteria for saying why a lot of people shouldn't be slaves, but he did defend it. And so therefore Aristotle is a bad guy. You know, this is the sort of thing that, that happens. Hegel would call that being at the prey of lesser, uh, but living, individualities. And there's many, many other ways in which, which this sort of can go on. Um, as a matter of fact, you might say that this is even part of the process, uh, not the natural process, but the, the spiritual process by which the dead are continued on and gradually disappear into being just a figment of somebody else's imagination or, or a, a part of their, their, um, their own story or being turned into props. Hegel doesn't think that this has to be what, has, what goes on. So he, goes, he says, the family keeps away from the dead this dishonoring of him by unconscious appetites and abstract entities. How does it do that? It puts its own action in their place. Weds the blood relation to the bosom of the earth, to the elemental imperishable individuality. They bury them, right? Uh, and it could be a burial. It could be sending them out to sea. It could be cremation. It could be putting them in, in the tower and letting the birds of the air devour them. It could be all sorts of things. Funerary rites. There are probably rituals associated with this as well and mindsets. Um, you know, sometimes uh, a period of mourning would be, would be part of this as well, which can go on for quite long. Notice what Hegel says this does. The family thereby makes him a member of a community which prevails over and holds under control the forces of particular material elements and the lower forms of life which sought to unloose themselves against him and to destroy him. The family keeps... The, the good family, the, the working family, doesn't keep the person alive, right? It, it's, it's, um, it's a misnomer a bit. Sometimes we, we console people after a uh, death of a, a loved one and we say, oh, well, they live on in our memories. Hegel would say, well, if they live on in our memories, they live on as a dead person in our memories. Um, and that's not quite what he has in mind. There is death here. But the family maintains the universality, maintains the being, maintains the personhood of the loved dead person. Loved not in the sense of natural affection or, you know, uh, something like that, but loving in, the, in the, the terms of action, in terms of doing what is for their good. This, this is something good for the dead person. The dead who do not enjoy the blood relations and the family, who die, you know, orphaned and alone or shipwrecked, uh, are not uh, afforded this sort of, of uh, continuance and protection. 